My name is Adnan Vatansever. I am a senior associate in the Energy and Climate Program here. And uh, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome you all to, to this event, uh, which is retitled as the Energy Efficiency, Global Energy Efficiency Opportunities. And it is hard to think of anybody better qualified to talk about this subject than Art Rosenfeld. Uh, I guess he does not need a long introduction, but I'm just gonna say a few words about uh, his background. And then we will have his uh, speak for about 40 minutes. Uh, and after that, we're gonna have a short break when you can uh, go and get lunch and we will continue with the Q&A session. Uh, we are planning to break up at 12.30. Uh, Art Rosenfeld is the distinguished scientist emeritus at Lawrence Berkeley Lab. There, he devotes much of his attention to an international campaign for the adoption of white roofs and cool colored surfaces to reduce heat islands and mitigate global warming. He helped create the Berkeley Labs Center for Building Sciences, where he and his colleagues developed ways to curb energy use and to meet new energy efficiency standards. Today, those standards are required in many other states. Art Rosenfeld also is the co-founder of the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy and the University of California's Institute for Energy and the Environment. He served as senior advisor on energy efficiency for the Department of Energy, and he currently serves on two advisory committees at the Department of Energy. Uh, he served for 10 years from 2000 to 2010 as the commissioner for the California Energy Commission. Uh, and an interesting fact is that California's electricity has been, electricity consumption per capita has been stabilized. It has been growing only minimally as he will illustrate during his presentation. And actually, the energy efficiency community have labeled this as the Rosenfeld effect. Uh, he has received uh, numerous awards, which will take a lot of time to count them, but uh, maybe I'll just mention two of them. Five years ago, he received uh, the very prestigious uh, Fermi, uh, Enrico Fermi Award, and he received this from the Energy Secretary Samuel Bodman on behalf of the US uh, President. Most recently, he received the Global Energy Prize from the President of Russia, Dmitry Medvedev. This prize is one of the most prestigious international awards granted for outstanding scientific achievements in the field of energy, which have proved of the benefit of the entire human race. Uh, Art, the floor is yours. I'll stand up and ask if you can see me equally well if I sit down. Uh, can you, can, uh, and I'm closer to the mic. If he wants to stand, that's okay. Uh, is, if this is okay, I can run the mouse. I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm pretty well organized. Thank you, Adnan, for your nice introduction. Um, I'm going to talk. Let, let's see. How, how's the volume at the back of the room? Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the prize itself and my surprise at getting the prize and what, that, what I can psych out about what that means about what's going on in Russia. And uh, then I'm actually going to go through the parts of the talk that I, a couple of talks that I gave at universities in Russia, uh, which involves two parts. Um, one, efficiency, but I didn't want to appear like a Westerner who parachutes in and gives prescriptions about how the Russians should improve their energy efficiency. So I pick some examples from California and from China. And uh, did say that they had plenty of energy efficiency experts in Russia. What they needed to do was to follow President Medvedev's lead and pay attention to them. Um, so uh, that's what's going to occupy the like 40 minutes. And then 
we can have some questions and answers. On the other hand, if I see something uh, that's uh, really unclear or wrong or the units are wrong or something, um, feel free to interrupt during the presentation. So uh, I was uh, doing my email one night in like May and uh, got an email from the executive director or the president of the World Global Energy Prize from Moscow uh, saying that uh, I was the fortunate recipient of this prize, which I had uh, barely ever heard of. And so I tried to learn a little bit about it. Um, every year, starting in 2002, uh, the Russian government, ne quote, negotiates, unquote, with uh, the two gas and oil exporting companies and with the Russian electric grid and extracts from them uh, what the Nobel Prize g g awarded last year, plus about 5%. It's uh, the Russians' answer to say, uh, we're in the prize notable prize-giving business, too. Um, the reason, I don't know why it's attracted very little attention in the United States, but I think the reason is that uh, they tended to be uh, uh, applied but very high tech. Um, the Russians, uh, dating back from the communist days, still seem to have the dregs of an idea that uh, lots of electricity and lots of gas is a manifest good. Uh, they're interested in fusion, fission, that is nuclear power, and uh, exporting the gas and oil. And uh, apart from their first recipient, uh, they haven't gotten a lot of coverage in the West. Um, incidentally, before I go on to showing some slides, um, there's a not very visible uh, mouse here. I hope you can see it. Um, uh, this presentation is available. I have a website, which is artrosenfeld.org. Uh, I see we're also being filmed, but I don't know whether that's going to be available. It will be on Carnegie's website, yes. OK. And uh, of course, you, you have this presentation, and you yes. can put that up, too. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> I think I'm going to <clears throat> show you uh, the first, the only slide I showed uh, a lot in Russia on the importance of energy efficiency uh, and talk about uh, President Medvedev for a moment. Um, This is a plot which has, which is very well known. It's not, not at all uh, hard to find. It's on every monthly issue of Energy Information Monthly um, on the Energy Information website. But I, I plotted it up to make it a little bit more dramatic. And it has US business as usual in red, U.S. actual in blue, and Russian actual in light blue. Uh, the unit on the left-hand scale is energy intensity, which is the amount of energy used in British thermal units, which nobody uses anymore except the United States, uh, per dollar of gross domestic product. And uh, the absolute numbers mean nothing, but the, the slopes, the more steepwards or downward slope, the 
more rapidly improvement in efficiency. Efficiency is one over this number, but the economists seem to like to plot energy intensity. The uh, scale runs from what I would call business as usual from 1949 to 1973. Uh, something happened in 1973, as you can see, there was a severe sudden drop in actual. And uh, let's go through that. The red line is what I've arbitrarily called business as usual, and it has a slight uh, good slope, um, but it's only about half a percent a year. And that's because for the last 100 years, uh, either better fuels come in, like we went from wood to coal to oil to natural gas, uh, and we learn something, and steel gets stronger and can run at higher temperatures and so forth and so on. Uh, that's the way the marketplace takes care of some gradual slope. Then in September or November, I guess it was September of 1973, uh, in a spat over the British control of the Suez Canal, the OPEC uh, embargoed oil shipments to the West and prices shot up from $2 a barrel to $10 a barrel. Uh, then, then dollars a barrel, a little more significant now. And uh, we had all sorts of scandals. The United States really had no idea what to do. There was a shortage of oil. Uh, in California, at least, we had uh, odd-numbered license plates got fuel on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, and even-numbered license plates got fuel on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays. We were at uh, 14 miles per gallon. Um, people understood so little about energy that people would sit in their ga ga gasoline, waiting in the gasoline lines with their engines running and run out of gasoline in line. Uh, and uh, uh, that was the beginning of our awakening to the fact that we were not a very energy efficient society. Uh, these were sort of magnificent years in which automobile fuel economy, cafe standards came in, corporate automobile fuel economy standards came in, and we went from 14 miles per gallon to 28 miles per gallon in 10 years, uh, and all sorts of other uh, easy-to-do, low-hanging fruit improvements. Um, then, uh, as a result of these improvements, worldwide OPEC's market uh, quit expanding and started contracting or stayed flat when it was supposed to have doubled by 1985 and OPEC collapsed with overproduction capacity, overcapacity. And uh, uh, Reagan and Thatcher said they'd licked the energy problem and we didn't make much progress more than uh, <coughs> half percent a year for about 10 years. And then this extra gap is a combination of efficiency, uh, mainly driven by computers and the world getting flat and uh, international markets taking over. And uh, now some numbers. Um, these are US numbers, of course. Um, the right-hand scale is in dollars. So this is a certain number of millions of BTU. Actually, it's 100 quadrillion BTU. And in the year 2007, uh, the United States end users, that is people who buy gasoline, utilities who buy natural gas and coal, industry, um, spent $1.2 trillion, which is 9% of gross domestic product on energy. How much would this have been if we hadn't <coughs> modified our behavior and used our brains? The answer is $2.1 trillion or 15% of gross domestic product. The difference is $0.9 trillion every year, or growing. And uh, to give you uh, some idea, uh, a feel for that, um, $900 billion in 2007 was actually the budget for the whole Department of Defense, including fighting one and a half wars. So if you, you want to make a comparison, we are saving enough money 
to run the largest military installation in the world uh, without even having felt that we're freezing in the dark at all. Uh, now, uh, I'll get on to some of the reasons for that in a minute. Uh, what about Russia? Well, Russia before 1992, when this story starts, was just chaos, robber barons, and uh, I don't want to go there. Uh, it's pretty inefficient, uh, even giving them the benefit of the doubt. There are two ways to measure gross domestic product. One is exchange rate, but the ruble may be valued or undervalued uh, at the whim of stock markets. Um, a, a better way to do it is purchasing power parity, which is an adjustment of gross domestic product for standard of living, which brings us down, but is still uh, pretty inefficient, like uh, three times the dark blue American line. Then, uh, in 2001 or 2002, it started coming down very steeply. And uh, this is rather little energy efficiency. It's uh, the Russian economy becoming a market economy, uh, beginning to turn off unprofitable, very inefficient power plants, aluminum smelters, other heavy industry. Um, and the beginnings of some energy efficiency in this region here, um, this curve ends in 2006, that's the latest data available. Uh, but you can see that it's coming down uh, and will cross American trends uh, in something like 2020. Um, what's Medvedev got to do with all this? Well, uh, I didn't, I'm in, in, in no way a Russian scholar, but I did read a little bit. Um, shortly after he came into power in the fall of 2009, he issued an executive order uh, stating that Russian E over GDP this energy intensity was going to improve 14% from the end of 09 till 2020, which means it's continuing this slope. Uh, now, we're, we're beginning to wake up to energy efficiency and we're doing 2.5% uh, a year. Uh, they're doing 14% in 10 years of energy efficiency. Uh, but this slope is, is huge. Um, nevertheless, uh, I think it's going to continue for some time. Um, Medvedev seems to have a something of an environmental streak. I'll get around to a story about him in a minute. And has set up an actual agency within the department, Ministry of Energy, called the Russian Energy Agency. Uh, I met for a few hours with its director, uh, who uh, had a long his deputy director, the director was called out for a meeting and I got along very well with the deputy director who's an acad academic, an academician in fact, uh, who said that his, he's Mr. Grigoriev, or Dr. Grigoriev. He has announced that he was the chairman of the Moscow chapter of World Wildlife which I thought was rather a good sign. And uh, he estimated that they are really going to do 15% uh, a year on energy improvement. Um, and actually, uh, I, I 
I asked him whether I was going to give a talk at the university the next day, whether I should talk about uh, whether there was any interest in Russia and white roofs to delay global warming. And to my surprise, he said, yeah, that a couple of years ago, he would have said, no, the Russians aren't interested in climate change particularly. Uh, they figure Siberia is a pretty cold place and uh, a few degrees, they can afford to take a few degrees of warming. Um, but he said the conditions in the summer of not 2011, but 2010, when there were really severe forest fires and drought, Moscow was almost uninhabitable because of smoke. And there were six weeks in which even the evening temperature never got below 30 degrees centigrade, which is how much? 87. Thank you. I, I, I pretty much converted to metric units, but I have to think Fahrenheit to know whether how hot I am. Uh, and so uh, even the Russian newspapers now uh, seem to be talking about extremes of weather. Of course, you can't tell from any one particular hot spell, but I get the general impression that there are a lot of folks in the world who think that uh, hundred-year floods and hundred-year droughts and so on are coming every 30 or 40 years, uh, for right or for wrong. Um, so let me present a couple of pictures. So here are the two lucky winners. Oh, yeah, I, I, I forgot to say I got an email and then a phone call from the president of the Global Energy Fund who instructed me that on a certain night in Berkeley, which was going to be at 10 o'clock of a certain morning in Moscow, uh, there was going to be a press release and a press conference on the prize award. And I was supposed to be at the phone at Berkeley at 11 o'clock at night and to express su extreme surprise when I got the phone call. So uh, they're uh, attempting to follow the Nobel Prize and its traditions. Um, so I expressed su extreme surprise and uh, I'm really extremely surprised and uh, I, I, I think that uh, Medvedev is having some influence in his campaign for energy efficiency. And I will get to that in a moment. Uh, this is my lucky co-laureate, Philip Rutberg, who is an expert at biofuels. And this is me. This is I. And... Uh, the badges, which are turned around so you can't read them, are all high security clearance badges. Um, this event took place, this was the prize itself on June 17th, took place at the, a, a very prestigious annual conference in St. Petersburg called the Annual Economic Forum. And everybody who's anybody seems to leave Moscow and go to the Annual Economic Forum. And uh, so we were supposed to wear our security badges even on stage, except they're badly designed, so they're printed on one side only, and with a lanyard, they only 50% chance that they show. Um, there is uh, the president presenting me with my prize, and oops. Um, then I gave a five-minute speech in which I praised the Russians for their heightened interest in environmentalism. And then met, uh, Philip Rutberg got his prize, and 
he gave an extremely interesting five minute talk, which he seems to have practiced very carefully. And uh, uh, the idea that he's got is the following. Uh, years ago, before there was a lot of oil discovered in the 1900s, um, we used to make natural gas all over the world in the form of what's called, we used to make what we now have as natural gas. We used to make as what was called town gas or city gas. And it consisted of burning at a high temperature uh, coal and water. And from that, you can get carbon monoxide and hydrogen, which burns nicely and lit homes and businesses in Europe and the United States. Uh, that went out of practice when natural gas was discovered. Uh, now, uh, there's lots of equivalent of coal in the form of biomass, uh, city waste, and plastic. And uh, Rittberg has demonstrated in a lab at a ton an hour, we're, t we're talking the need for kilotons per hour, uh, the ability to do quite efficiently the uh, disintegration of uh, domestic waste and plastic by hitting it basically with a low-powered lightning strike, which is called the plasma torch. The plasma torch requires, uses up 10% of the energy of combustion of the, of the waste, but you get that energy in the form of heat, and it goes into the town gas. And so he's discovered uh, a, a way that looks engineeringly sensible for doing a huge waste to energy project. And then he went on to his real dream in the last two minutes, which is, and if Russia really wanted, Medvedev, remember, is listening intently. Um, if the Russians really want to do something dramatic, um, they can go convert some uh, tankers to collect these huge islands of plastic which are floating around in gyres in the Indian Ocean and uh, take them ashore and process them into gas from which you can make electricity or which you can use as a feedstock. What amazed me was at the end of the program, Medvedev was supposed to go back to the microphone and say, well, that's the end, folks. Thank you very much. And instead, he went back to the microphone and said, uh, Academician Goodberg, I have listened to your very compelling talk, and I will see to it that your project gets funded. Well, uh, it seems like it takes uh, somebody with an environmental inclination and some power to get up to the microphone and say that. I can't imagine a, a Western diplomat or a president, a chief of state, doing that off the cuff without consulting his uh, uh, scientific advisor. But anyway, that project seems to be launched. And uh, I'm going to go ahead. Oh, oh this was a, a, a funny incident on the prize. This is on the stage after Medvedev had walked off. The uh, gentleman here is the American ambassador who flew up from Moscow. Uh, I had been invited to fly up with Moscow because he got a letter from Obama. He was supposed to have a letter from Obama congratulating me on getting the prize. The cable from Obama never arose, and so poor Mr. Bar Barley had nothing to say except uh, he wanted to congratulate the me on behalf of the United States. And then he flew back to Moscow and probably gritted his teeth. Uh, This is uh, uh, the original winner of the prize and the vice president of the Soviet Academy of Sciences, uh, Evgeny Velikov and Rutberg, and me at a gala dinner. And now I'm going to go on. 
Um, this is the slide that I did show about Russian electricity efficiency um, in California, which is, on which I'm very proud. Um, it starts with, it's in kilowatt hours per person from 1960 to 1973, the same embargo. Uh, and then with building standards and appliance standards and uh, rebate programs from electricity, uh, we've managed to keep electricity use per constant, per capita constant for 35 years. The United States was a little slower on the draw, a little less consistent, uh, has gone up 50%. Now, uh, some of this is just what I call the Camelot effect, the weather in California. People still live mainly along the coast and the climate is ideal. Uh, and some of it is that we don't have any coal and we don't have any cheap electricity. And that's about a third of the effect. And about a third of the effect is building standards and so on. Uh, nevertheless, the combination of slightly more expensive electricity and a mild climate and using our brains has fixed it so that although our electric rates are higher, our bills are much lower, uh, about $500 per year per household, than uh, the typical American living in the Midwest with coal. So we're very proud of that. Um, This is something on standards from an American point of view, and then I'm going to show you a Chinese point of view. Um, this is refrigerators from 1947 to 1973. Um, let me first get the size out of the way. That's the red line. Um, it grew out of control as people struggled to get through the refrigerator door, the, the maximum electric capacity, uh, freezer capacity and uh, cooling capacity they could get, which meant for thinner and thinner insulation and cheaper motors. And then it leveled off because of the kitchen door uh, about 1973, luckily. Um, this is the electric use going up from 400 kilowatt hours, which was about, um, at today's prices, would be uh, 40 bucks a year uh, to 200 bucks a year at today's prices in 1973. And then the effect of the first labels and standards in California brought it down to here. The California standards ruled the country until uh, Mr. Reagan left office in 1988. And then the feds took over. And uh, we're now down to a quarter of what we were in 1973, and the price, instead of going up for the better refrigerator with the better controls and the better heat exchangers and so on, because we forced everybody to redo his production lines, um, the price has come down almost as fast as the energy use has come down, and that's a good advertisement for green jobs. I'm going to show you the Chinese version of that in a minute. In fact, I'm going to go to the Chinese version of that in a minute. In, right now. Oh, no, I can't resist this one. This is air conditioning, which is down to a quarter. Uh, air conditioning per square foot. Uh, for, uh, for a house in Sacramento, it would have gone up to here by 2010 because houses have gotten bigger. But the air conditioners have doubled in efficiency, and that takes you down to here. And then houses have New houses in California have better insulation, better shading of windows, better windows, uh, more efficient fans, and so on. And that takes you down to here, which is down to a quarter. Lighting per square foot in commercial buildings is down to one-fifth. And the, the lighting is better now than it was before. Uh, with the impact of compact fluorescence lighting in, commercial, in residential buildings is way down. Um, this is Chinese progress in air conditioning, refrigeration at the bottom, air conditioning at the top, and the Three Gorges Dam output for comparison. This is the world's largest construction project 
was finished 10 years ago uh, cost $22 billion for 22 gigawatts, 22,000 megawatts. Uh, this is the electricity produced, will be produced in the year 2020. Three Gorges Dam is tapped out. In fact, it's beginning to silt up. Um, th this is what Chinese refrigerator standards, if they're not further improved, will save in 2020 or twice Three Gorges. Uh, this is saving money. This is generating income, but it costs money to invest. I, I support Three Gorges Dam. Um, in dollars, air conditioning and refrigerators alone, uh, this is wholesale money on the Yangtze River still has to be gotten to the cities like Shanghai or Beijing, a couple of thousand miles, transmission lines, distribution lines, management, and so on. This is worth, the Chinese say, a little less than five cents a kilowatt hour wholesale, but the end user in Moscow is paying nine cents a kilowatt hour. So in dollars, here's three gorges, and here's refrigerators and air conditioners uh, in 2020. Uh, savings are $18 billion a year, which means you could buy a Three Gorges, another one, every year. Uh, you don't want to get into that, but uh, it's a lot of money. That's been so successful, whoops, that the Chinese have now passed building sta I'm sorry, appliance standards on 19 other products. This is Three Gorges stuck at uh, the scale's low, but this is Three Gorges stuck at 100 terawatt hours per year. This is the 19 additional standards. In energy, Three Gorges is beginning to become insignificant. In dollars, Three Gorges just doesn't become worth noticing at all. And in fact, the profits are up to, f the savings are up to $50 billion a year, which is enough to buy a Three Gorges, two of them, every year. And I thought that was a nice example of what a organized society can do with standards. Uh, I'm I have like seven minutes left. Uh, I'm going to take fifteen. <laughs> uh, I rambled too much at the beginning, but um, I think I will if it's okay with you. Uh, I think I'm going to take fifteen. Fifteen. Sure, yeah. And what can you say, poor man? <laughs> uh, oh, I'm going to say one thing because there's been so much fuss about we're taking away, standards are taking away the consumer's right to buy light bulbs. Um, in California, because we had lighting standards, uh, we got a, we at the Energy Commission drafted efficiency standards for incandescent lamps, uh, effective in January 2011, so effective last January. Um, the feds followed suit, but with a two-year delay, and there was an attempt to repeal that activity on the grounds that incandescent lamps were going to disappear from the market. What I just wanted to say is that if you go into an appliance store in California today, uh, a 100-watt lamp bulb, what used to be a 100-watt lamp bulb, uh, that is, it produces this much light, is now using only 72 watts. Uh, I called my friends at the Energy Commission to see if there have been any uh, demonstrations, uprisings, revolutions. Nobody seems to have noticed. Everybody seems to be perfectly happy. Uh, People are buying 100 watt lamp bulbs for that use 72 watts, and it seems to work fine. And I predict it will work fine two years from now, a year and a half from now in the United States. Uh, heat islands, 15 minutes. Um, this is a cartoon because it assumes there's no wind and you can attribute the temperature to where the cooling effect was. But this is a typical 
let me see, a typical Los Angeles basin. Um, when the ambient temperature is 85, the temperature downtown is around eight, eight or nine degrees Fahrenheit, hotter. Uh, why is that? Well, uh, trees evapotranspire in cool neighborhoods. Uh, civilization has tended to put on dark colored roofs and dark colored roads, and that makes heat, and the heat radiates to the nearest cloud, or the wind blows over the nearest rooftop and gets warm, and you get a heat island. And this is true of all cities. It's worse in the cities which are poorly ventilated and have mountains around them, like Phoenix or LA. Uh, it may be only five degrees in New York City. But everybody knows that it's hotter. Uh, cities are about 20% roof, 40% pavement, and depending on the city, 30% vegetation. You need all of them to cool the urban heat island. Um, if you make a roof of an air-conditioned building white, you reduce the air-conditioning load on the top floor, on the space under that building, by about 15% because the roof gets hot. Uh, until the last few years, roofs in warm climates were not well insulated, and so a lot, some of that insulation, some of that heat works its way through the insulation, heats the space below. Uh, and they mitigate heat islands. And so, uh, without a uh, thought about global warming, uh, in my first term as an energy commissioner, I served two terms. I interested the building standard staff in what can we do about white roofs on flat buildings, flat, flat roof buildings, low slope buildings technically, because they still have to drain. Um, are not visible from the street, so there's not, not, not an architectural issue. And uh, it turned out that it doesn't cost any more on a new building to order your roof in white than it does in red or green or orange. And you've got to put some sort of coating, waterproof coating on a roof anyway. And uh, I guess I was particularly bothered because I would land in places like Beijing or Singapore or Shanghai, and you would fly over acres of warehouses, which were painted blue or green or yellow, but never white. Um, I think because white shows dirt and has to be hosed down occasionally. But for that, we're paying a huge air conditioning load. So in California, in 2005 building standards, effective in 2008, uh, we decided that it was cost effective to require that all, quote, flat roofs, technically low slope, be white or vegetated. That gets a pass. Um, and that went into effect. And the big business is the, the re-roofing. Uh, building standards apply to new buildings, but they also apply to major retrofits, re-roofs. Your roof is last 20 years, the warranty's gone out, it's starting to leak, it's gonna, the top of it's gonna get, go to the dump. Uh, that, that requires a permit and can be controlled. So California is now going white on retrofits on flat roofs. Most commercial roofs are flat, uh, about 5% a year. And I'll show you a couple of slides. Um, it also turns out that if you select tiles which don't have a lot of carbon black and other contaminants in them, that they run quite cool. Uh, I won't go into the physics because I've only got a few minutes left. Um, but I will say that black tends to run 50 degrees centigrade, 90 degrees Fahrenheit above ambient. Uh, so does, um, so do these darkish colors, whereas white runs maybe 10 degrees Fahrenheit above ambient, and so it's a much smarter choice for cooling a city. 
Um, in the Chicago heat wave of 1995, there were 700 deaths, uh, a small enough number that the Chicago Department of Public Health visited every address. And the recipe for being lethal was you live on the top floor under a hot roof of a building with a black roof and you stay there for three days when the air conditioning fa fails. Uh, in Europe, this business of extremes got pretty extreme in August of 2003, 30,000 deaths. Uh, the Moscow Center heat wave uh, was on the order of magnitude of 10,000 deaths. I've seen some newspaper reports at 14,000. So there's some advantage to public health. Uh, Greece is well known for have known this for 2,000 years. That's some white roofs and unconditioned dwellings, apartment buildings in Hyderabad. That's Walmart store early when in Northern California, Walmart decided as a matter of policy to make all its roofs, new roofs and re-roofs white starting in 2005. They've done 4,000 roofs. They have 2,000 to go. Uh, that's University of California Davis under the Let's Stay White regime and uh, so forth and so on. Um, now, what about cooling the world? And why do I have some striking figures? And why did I insist on you going on? Um, radiate on the Earth is a lot of energy, about a kilowatt of solar of sunshine per square yard. Uh, the trick to do is to reflect it back into space. Space is, after all, transparent to what came in. It's transparent to what goes back out again. And then you don't heat the world. Uh, the greenhouse effect, of course, is here because uh, the Earth is not a good reflector. It's typical. The typical reflectivity of a forest is 22%. And 80% uh, then, roughly, of the heat gets captured. Degra of the sunshine gets captured, degraded into heat, and that's trapped by carbon dioxide and water vapor and heats the earth a huge amount, and that's why we're here. Everything would be frozen if it weren't for the greenhouse effect. The problem is not to have the greenhouse effect change by a lot in a short time. So excess heat is being generated because carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas, and we glaciers are melting. Our white surfaces in the form of Arctic ice are melting, and we need all the white we can get. And a reasonably interesting replacement is to make roofs white in cities where you have these co-benefits anyway. Uh, that's the moral. Um, if you make the calculation how much, uh, if all cities in the tropics, where this is a really non-controversial idea, Went, roof, went white. And incidentally, most roofs in the tropics are flat. There's not a lot of snow load in New Delhi. So the architecture doesn't follow Western Europe with sloped roofs. Um, uh, it's the tropics and the temperate zones as far north in American language as, say, Chicago, which has uncomfortably hot summers, or Boston, which has uncomfortably hot summers, um, where it pays to save energy in air-conditioned buildings. If you do that, you calculate you cool the world something like a tenth of a degree. Now, at first, that sounds, we've known that for 10 years or so. Uh, not an easy sell. On the other hand, what uh, my colleague Hasha Akbari and I at Berkeley uh, said in, 20, in a paper in 2007 was, uh, let's, let, let's make a very simple analogy. Uh, carbon dioxide heats the world. A ton of carbon dioxide up there heats the world a certain amount. And uh, a square foot of white roof cools the world. And let's set the two effects equal and talk about the cooling in units of avoided or offsets of carbon dioxide. 
Well, then all of a sudden you get big numbers and you get numbers that everybody knows. And so uh, there's the micro number and there's the macro number. The micro number says that if you coat a thousand square feet, a sort of gray, dingy roofing with a reflectivity of 10%, with white, you offset, it's still up there heating the world, but you offset the emissions of 10 tons of CO2. 10 tons of CO2 is what the family car emits in about a year. So the first year you whitewash your roof, you've, or well, you don't whitewash your roof. You, your, your roof is old and it's gonna get recoded. And the first year you take advantage of that. Um, you offset the effects of the family car for 10 years, for a year. Now this thousand square feet is gonna last about 20 years. So it's a 5% effect. Well, a 5% effect is 5% of the way to a goal, a, 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 a goal which we need to avoid a dangerous problem, which is gonna involve wars and starvation and a lousy world for our grandchildren. So uh, I don't advertise this as a solution, but I advertise it as 5% of a solution. And a lot of people are working on other solutions and uh, I, it, it, it's a nice, it's a nice step. To, to give you some example of the potential on the worldwide effect, um, supposing you offset all the flat roofs in my candidate world, and you don't double count, you take out of the fact that uh, the Mediterranean already has lots of white roofs and some parts of the United States already have lots of white roofs. The answer is you offset the world's emissions of CO2 for two thirds of a year, like turning the whole world off for two thirds of a year. Now that's uh, sort of impressive, getting there. Um, a, a gigaton for scientific language is a billion metric tons. Um, but uh, I, s I still don't know how to do with that because there's a 20 year issue. So let me just give in and say, I gotta pull this trick once every 20 years. 20, over 20 years, 24 gigatons is 1.2 gigatons per year. Call that order of magnitude 100, one, one gigaton a year. Now what will one gigaton a year do? I'll give you two examples. One is cars off the road. Remember, there are a lot of, white roo there are a lot of flat roofs in the world. There, there are still a limited number, only 600 million cars in the world. Uh, it's equivalent to taking 300 of the 600 million passenger cars out of commission for 20 years. Then you've run out of roof and you need some more bright tricks. But maybe we'll learn to have renewable energy by then. Uh, I'm gonna make half the cars in the world disappear and give you an, another example. Um, in terms of power plants, uh, the white roof potential has the potential to offset the emissions of 500 medium size, that's what's now popular, coal-fired power plants, or if you've got the coal-fired power plants turned off and you're worried about gas-fired power plants, which we're building lots of all around the world, uh, that's, uh, they're, they're, they're a factor two cleaner, so it's equivalent to offsetting not having to build and therefore not having to operate uh, a thousand medium-sized gas-fired power plants. That's just the albedo effect. If you're in places like the United States and you're paying for it, you get a comparable reduction in real CO2 uh, my last remark is um, uh, some of us have uh, started a new nonprofit launched by DOE, Department of Energy, called Global Cool Cities Alliance. And um, along here with us here is Kurt Schickman, whom I'm going to ask to stand up in a minute. And so you get to know his face. Um, the Department of Energy has an activist, Steve Chu, the secretary, who's uh, been very active in supporting these ideas. Uh, luckily, his voice is about 1,000 times as loud as mine. And luckily, he was director of LBL when this idea came along, so he's appreciated it for some time. 
Um, we got uh, $300,000 from the Department of Energy to do domestic work on cool roofs. There's still a lot of states that haven't uh, seen the white light. Um, and then uh, Chu offered a voluntary agreement to other members of the G20 energy ministers last spring and uh, to form a cool roofs and pavements working group jointly with any member of the G20 as a member and any country as an observer. Uh, so far, Mexico, Japan, and India have signed up and other countries are signing up. And GCCA has been appointed the implementing agency for these uh, activities. Uh, and we have something like 60 other subnational states or cities who are interested in joining our 100 Cool Cities Club, which is soon going to run out of space. Uh, so things are moving pretty fast. Um, I thought it would be nice instead of just uh, preaching at you about energy efficiency to give you try to give you one newish idea. And uh, Kurt, can you uh, stand up? And um, I I think um, I would like to go back and leave this website, Global Cool Cities Alliance, for you to write down uh, my website. And I presume Adnan will tell you how to mm -hmm. find all these things on the, his website. And I thank you very much. Art, thank you very much for extremely informative uh, talk. Uh, as we are running short of time slightly what i would suggest is uh, we start with a q a session right away if somebody feels that he or she needs to urgently go and get a lunch uh, they can do so but let, let's just start with a q a session as we have like uh, 27 minutes left until 12 30. Uh, is that okay art that's with you? wonderful okay uh, maybe i could kick off the the, the discussion by asking a, a just one quick question. I know in terms of energy efficiency and based on your experience, you have faced probably quite a few challenges. Some of them related to lack of sufficient regulatory environment. Others have to do with lack of awareness. Others have to do with uh, difficulties in financing these projects. But regarding the awareness issue, uh, I just wonder, is it getting easier to raise the awareness for this uh, for energy efficiency projects, given that we are uh, actually in a period of quite significant communication revolution? Uh, yeah. Um, what's, <clears throat> what's new and very bad is the extreme polarization of the Congress. And uh, and people's focus on unemployment, which is, of course, a real right now here pain, uh, is such that uh, climate change per se was higher on people's interest lists two years ago than it is today. On the other hand, gasoline prices certainly talk and uh, corporate recognition of these matters uh, is certainly large. Um, I don't have much to say in the way of constructive things except for two. One is there is no silver bullet, and I think we all recognize that uh, Global warming is, not we all, I think there's still a significant number of us who recognize that global warming is a, is a real threat. Um, and that we need, 
we need research and research and development on this these issues critically. Um, we, 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 we just need to to keep up with efficiency to buy more time. But I don't um, have a, a big idea. I, I, except I, I, I guess I will say that in the long run, we've, we've got to have, we've got to recognize that the price of fuel, fossil fuel has to go up. Uh, we have to get around the notion that uh, an energy tax is uh, a third rail uh, politically. Um, cap and trade is is just an, a complicated way of avoiding an energy tax, and what we really need is for the price of fossil fuel to go up as it becomes scarce. But I don't know how to sell that except uh, a few inventions at a time. All right, thank you. Uh, let's just start the Q&A session. Uh, yes, Ira. I, I'd also like to ask you to identify yourself as this is uh, being going to be on video as well. Uh, thank you. Ira Birnbaum from USAID, and thanks for the always fascinating remarks. It was uh, very instructive and, and always informative. Um, I'm, I'm curious, we, I, I know that the Russian Energy Agency is really, you know, making a, a, a strong effort to try to create a new culture uh, and, and launch activities for energy efficiency in Russia. But could you sense after your um, uh, presentation at the ceremony there what the attitude was from the top government uh, officials about interest or willingness to uh, put in place the proper legal or policy framework to really allow energy efficiency to flourish in Russia? Um, no, Ira. Um, I, 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 I did try to uh, psych out a little bit what um, the Russian um, academic community felt, which is not answering your question. Because um, uh, I was r really amazed that uh, that uh, two people like Rutberg and I were selected. The, the prize selection committee, as is typical in the Nobel Prize too, um, w is very international. It has 10 Russians and 10 developed country people, Americans, um, representatives from IEA, in International Energy Agency, um, so forth and so on. Um, I was told that the Western half, if I can call it that, it certainly includes Japan, um, had actually wanted to nominate Rutberg for his interest in the environmental things the year before, and the Russians weren't interested. And then this time, uh, both Rutberg and I got well, we were nominated to everybody, but got supported by the Western delegation, and the Russians flipped and said, yeah, maybe that's a good idea. So there seems to be some sort of vague progress, but I can't say any more than that. Yes. Oh, yes, my name is Pete Kelly. One second. Hello, my name is Pete Kelly. Uh, here in Washington, our heating, our heating season is about six months. Our cooling season is about two months. And so that means that uh, we would use more energy for heating than we would for cooling. And I wonder how much that might offset. Uh, that, that's that, that's uh, a very good question, and I, I, luckily I can answer it. Um, the, uh, all the economics are done on the basis of taking into account what we call the winter penalty, which is what you're talking about. Uh, in Washington, D.C., assuming you have conventional compressor air conditioning and gas heat, in dollars, after you've s happily saved one dollar in the summer, you, are, you inadvertently have committed yourself to, to spending 12 cents extra in the winter. And the reason it's such a small ratio, 
is that in the summer, the sun is high and it sees mainly the rooftop and it barely sees the south wall. In the winter, the sun is low and it sees mainly the south wall and barely sees the rooftop. And so, and then it's also short, short hours and stormier and cloudier and so on. So it turns out that uh, Murphy's Law fails and actually if you're into passive buildings, you want a white roof, in, in a climate like this, you want a white roof to cool your city and cool your house and cool the world and a dark south wall to capture heat in the winter. But thank you very much. Hugh Haskell from the Energy Institute for Energy and Environmental Research. What was your name? Uh, Hugh Haskell. Oh. Uh, the uh, do you have some data on on roughly how much the white roofs will reduce the heat, the urban heat effect? Uh, and also, I'm wondering what about reflective asphalt for streets and parking lots? Is that uh, going to have a could that have a significant effect? Yes. Uh, let me let me give you some answers from our study a detailed study of a plan for Los Angeles, um, which involved white roofs and uh, cool colored roofs, which I won't go into, but they're only half as effective. Cool pavements and planting 12 million shade trees. Um, that is not just, street, not just street trees, maybe six million of those, but trees shading the south and the west of houses, deciduous trees, so that they let the sunlight in in the wintertime. Um, the Los Angeles heat island itself, I mentioned, is about, I'm going to talk in Fahrenheit, is about 8 degrees Fahrenheit. And incidentally, getting hotter about 1 degree every 10 years, so comparable and adding to global warming. Um, the savings were about 2 degrees from the avoided heat. The heat reduction was about two degrees from roofs, direct effect. Uh, two degrees from cooling the city and cooling everybody else's air conditioner. That is, two, two, um, let, let me just say the effect of, oh, I'm sorry, try again, Art. Two degrees from white roofs and all, all effects. Two degrees from cool pavements. Concrete color pavements, not white pavements. That would be glary and stuff. But switching from asphalt colored to concrete colored actually just means switching the color of the rock that you use as the aggregate. Uh, and four degrees, this is all Fahrenheit, for uh, shade trees. Uh, so the trees are very important, but luckily the economics pays for itself. Trees are also expensive, but of course they add to real estate values. It's an amenity which is hard to discuss quantitatively, but um, you can cancel the LA heat island uh, with these steps. Uh, and four degrees is, is significant. I mean, I remind you that uh, uh, in terms of extremes, um, well, four degrees is significant. Okay, yes, go ahead, please. Uh, Henry Hedka, researcher at NARA. Uh, I've, I've heard there's been costing some individual upstate New York like $1,000 a month to heat their home using fuel oil. Um, this relates to the automobiles you mentioned, uh, trucks. I've, I've heard on WTOP there's now a billion vehicles on the road. All this is fuel oil. Now, that being the case, what do you suggest as a solution to this terrible problem, say, for home heating? Should they be converted to electric heat? Uh, would that help? Uh, what, what to do? Is there a need for a national program like this? Well, first of all, you certainly wouldn't convert to electric resistance heat. That, that's That's three times more expensive per, per heat delivered. Um, in, in some parts of the country, you can retrofit what are called heat pumps, which you are uh, more efficient uh, way of uh, 
running your air conditioner backwards, so to speak, and cooling the outside and heating the inside. But um, that, that's, that's a problem for retrofit with insulation and leaky buildings and so on. That's, that's not a supply side issue. That's uh, uh, leaky, poorly insulated, uh, out of date buildings. Um, we just can't afford to build buildings like that anymore and we've got to retrofit the ones that we have. Yes, we have time for, uh, for a few more questions. Uh, yes. Sir, in the back. James Sang, retired. Uh, on a global scale, what is the what, what kind of perturbation uh, on your calculations th does CRUD play, i.e. Mumbai Air or Beijing Air? And two, uh, on a homeowner's point of view, how does the white roof compare to a well-ventilated attic? Let, let's see. The, the first thing, can, can you say a little bit more about... Uh, I mean, you have very dirty air where, where, in fact, over a period of a year or a period of a couple of, of, a couple of weeks, you'll have a, a fine coating of coal dust and stuff like that, uh, uh, assuming right, you right. don't have very efficient cleaning of the... R so right. Is um, it 20% effect or 10% effect? Have you guys looked at... Well, it, it, it's trickier than that. Um, in, we're, we're beginning to do experiments in India where the air in some cities is really cruddy. Yeah, they burn, they burn um, I, I'm guessing that the, t and labor is much cheaper. So I'm, I'm guessing that uh, the, um, the American and the Western solution, which is to buy high quality membrane or uh, coating with a warranty for 20 years is not the answer at all, but that you want to just whitewash your roof when the weather turns warm, uh, then the monsoon comes later on and washes off the whitewash, but you've gotten through the summer. And um, in, in Israel, for example, where they import oil to make electricity, and it's a security issue, um, and they don't want everybody running air conditioning, um, you were required by your community, all the roofs are flat, you were required by your community to whitewash your uh, roof uh, for one year's duration um, every summer. And you do it again next summer. So the solutions are different. Uh, white, white is still the universally available color, but uh, we, we have, have to worry about the aging a lot. You, you have a very good point. And then you had a second question. Roofs. How does how does the white white roof compare to a well ventilated attic? I my old house. Uh, we spent a lot of money making sure our attic was well ventilated, so we didn't need the air conditioning in New York. So and I had a black roof, but that seemed to work pretty well. And I'm wondering how how have people done the comparison? Um, first of all, we're not encouraging people to get up on a sloped roof and endanger life and limb. Uh, the, 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 you want to do both? No. Compared to if I have a 45 degree pitch roof on a 1,500 square, 2,000 square foot house and I have a good attic fan, how will that compare to a white roof as a solution? How about both? Uh, both? Com 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 comparable, but uh, let, let me make a serious point. New, New York City is adopting the California flat roof shall be white building standard uh, on a v v voluntary basis, not, not reinforced, starting January of next year, New York City. Uh, in general, the message that I'm giving you is uh, to adopt these measures of white roofs or cool colored roofs, and now I'm gonna have to say a word about cool colored roofs. Um, where, where they're cost effective in new construction and in new uh, buildings. And then you can have uh, a white roof on your new house, or if, if, you, if you don't like it, a cool colored roof on your new house, and uh, you can have a, should have a well-ventilated attic too. You need all the tricks you can get. Now, what is cool colored? Um, I won't show you a slide, but I will make the following effect, the following statement. When you hold your hand out in the sunshine and it feels warm, 
uh, half of the heat that's incident on your hand is visible. And if you want your hand, if your hand is black, then you can, if, if you want your hand to, if you paint your hand black, you're committed to absorbing all the visible light that's there, otherwise it won't look black. If you want it to look red, you have to absorb everything except the red. But there's an equal amount of energy in what's called the near-infrared, which you can't see. And there are lots of, now that we're sophisticated, there are lots of pigments you can select, which cost not very much, uh, and are reflective in the near-infrared, so they can be half as good as black, or red, or whatever. Um, in California, we are requiring cool colored materials, uh, cool colored pigments on sloped roofs, visible from the roof. You can't tell the difference in the visible, but they, are, they do run cooler. And uh, we do that now in the five out of the 16, five hottest out of the 16 climate zones. And uh, it seems to be being well accepted and the prices are coming down so they're not a luxury item anymore. And we will gradually expand that. And so uh, as, as building standards progress every three years, they'll get better and better and better. So I've given a little sermon in addition to answering your question. That's interesting. Uh, 10 years ago, I worked for two years in western China and in Yunnan province in the southwest. Most flat-roofed apartment buildings had solar panels on top. So I'm wondering... Had solar panels on top? On, on the roof. Yes. On the roofs to heat the water in the building. So, solar domestic hot water, absolutely. Yes, yes. And I'm wondering how that would compare, having the roof covered with solar panels, how does that compare with the reflective value of the color of the, of the roof itself. Very, very good point. Um, roofs in China, particularly, are getting to be a very valuable commodity. Um, the, you can get enough hot water from, in an apartment building to feed hot water to the four stores, stories below the roof. And the four top stories are more popular for that reason. Now that's high value property. And obviously, um, uh, solar domestic hot water, or if you can afford it, even photovoltaics, uh, get their, f their share of the roof first. Um, but uh, uh, there, there are a, a, a lot of places in the world where they don't have the resources for solar domestic hot water. Uh, for example, in Israel, there's still lots of white roofs which don't have solar, although they have some solar. Also, of course, if you're a one-story building or a two-story building, then you've got plenty of room for white and enough 20% of your roof for photovoltaics or, or solar domestic hot water, and you've still got plenty of white roof left over. And when I say white, I, I repeat, I automatically assume if it's vegetated, that's a good idea too. Again, that's more expensive. Uh, if you've got the money, more power to you. Uh, if you don't have the money, you should make it white. Yes, there is a question. Jessica Matthews from the Carnegie Endowment. Hello. Hi, Art. Um, I, I want to ask you a, a, a political question, um, sort of going back to where Adnan started. For, for those of us who are working on this issue since 1973 or even earlier, uh, do, you see, do you see progress outside of Washington, outside of the immediate, but in the, in the basic um, acceptance of the view that, that efficiency is a, is a good thing as opposed to a, a soft-headed, tree-hugging kind of concern and that um, a, 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 any greater appreciation of the of the power of it. It in it, from here it seems as though, with the exception of California, um, that study after study after study kind of comes out with these extraordinary numbers. I saw you flipping through the McKinsey numbers and stuff, and it seems to. 
um, really not have changed much, or at least not nearly as much as uh, I would have expected 40 years of, of research. And, um, so I just wanted to get your sense of beyond California, where, which is clearly a different universe in this, in this, one, in this one respect. Um, the, the one good thing seems to be that um, corporate interest in, in doing energy efficiency and saving money seem, seems to be on the rise. Uh, Walmart, for example, I, I, I said made a corporate decision. Now uh, we're finding that uh, uh, many companies uh, sort of like the idea that, uh, oh, white roofs save money and uh, they're green. I mean, they're, they're environmentally the right thing to do. Um, uh, Walmart is now, I think, in their pressure on their suppliers to go, quote, green, unquote, is now going to re recommend that their suppliers do white roofs. Um, so there, there's something in the culture that says in the business community it seems to work. But um, I agree with you, Jessica. We've been at this business a long time. And uh, it doesn't... It doesn't have the glamour of uh, photovoltaics or wind. Um, I, 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 want, I, I, I do think that uh, the one thing that people still find sort of cute is uh, when, when, the, when, a neat, when a neat idea comes along, um, and you see how, and you can show real progress, it does seem to get adopted eventually. I mean, compact fluorescent lamps. Uh, well, that was led by California. That, that's actually an interesting story. Uh, compact fluorescent lamps have been around for a long time. They weren't very reliable, and they didn't often burn for the 8,000 hours which they were promised. But the, the potential was huge. And when they did finally mature, they were like $15, pretty reliable, but $15 wholesale. And the California utilities um, realized that uh, over the life cycle of three years in a commercial building or six years in your house, the savings from a CFL were about $50 as compared to a chain of eight incandescents. And they said, listen, if society is gaining 50 bucks, we can afford to put two bucks into marketing. Well, two bucks a lamp into marketing is a, a neat thing. So what they said is they advertised all over the world to manufacturers that if that they would give the, a rebate directly to the manufacturers of so $2 per lamp sold in California. This is called an upstream buy-down. The, the wholesale price was about $3 in places like, none are made in the United States, in places like Shanghai and, uh, well, ch China in general, Taiwan, Prague, Mexico. Uh, the buy-down brought the wholesale price from $3 to $1. And then by the time it percolated its way through the retail chain, it was uh, back at 3 or 4 or $5 in uh, hardware stores in California. And they sold like hotcakes. In fact, they sold so as to make the statistics crazy because uh, they, they sold to the extent of something like... Uh, a pack or two per house, and then people were just putting in their closets waiting for the incandescents to wear out so they weren't saving electricity yet. And PG&E was getting paid profits for savings that weren't occurring yet. But um, uh, that, that's what, th th then it took over in the whole United States, and now I'm, I'm pleased to see there are lots of, I mean, if I go into a hotel anywhere in the United States now, 
uh, not just California, there are compact fluorescents on almost all retrofits. It's become part of the trade. So um, I, I think that really good ideas are, are penetrating slowly, but uh, slowly. <laughs> OK, thank you very much. Uh, I, I guess it's 12.30 right now. I would like to thank you, Art, for a very insightful talk. It was a real privilege to listen to you. And thank you, everybody, for coming.